Welcome back to Face the Nation. A new COVID-19 relief funding bill is working its way through Congress, but it is facing some challenges in the Senate. Democrat Chris Coons of Delaware joins us now from Wilmington. Good morning to you, Senator, and happy Easter. Happy Easter, Margaret. Great to be on with you. Leader Schumer has said new money for global vaccination will have to wait until later in the spring uh, because the Senate couldn't come to an agreement. There are still more than 3,000 people around the world dying from COVID each day, a new variant coming out roughly every four months. What do you see as the real world impact of this stall? Well, Margaret, I was so disappointed that we in Congress could not come together and deliver critically needed global help um, to deliver the vaccines that we've already invented, developed, and purchased, and to make sure that the nearly 3 billion people around the world who haven't yet had a single vaccine dose uh, get some protection against this pandemic. As we were fighting over this additional payment, this additional funding for COVID relief globally, one of my colleagues memorably said, well, my constituents are done with this pandemic. Margaret, just because we're done with the pandemic doesn't mean it's done with us. And the best way to protect the American people from the next variant that might kill more Americans and more people around the world is to ensure that the rest of the world has access to America's vaccines. Last point, there's dozens of countries that had to rely on Chinese and Russian vaccines that don't work. Uh, Senator Romney has argued that this needs to be paid for. Um, is there any compromise that you see here? Because I think you just said that the vaccine is sitting already purchased. So what happens? Does it just go bad if you don't come up with this funding? Um, we are going to lose millions of doses of vaccine that will expire. Uh, and I think that's part of the argument that I've been making to my Republican colleagues. Uh, we shouldn't waste this moment, this opportunity. Uh, I respect uh, Senator Romney's press for us to find offsets. But in a moment when we badly need additional emergency funding to support the Ukrainian military resistance against Russian aggression, to support millions of refugees uh, in Ukraine and around the region in Europe and throughout the world, and to provide uh, food relief and, and additional COVID relief, uh, I think we should treat this as emergency spending. Uh, but frankly, we'll negotiate what we have to in order to secure a chance to move forward and not waste the vital vaccines America has already purchased. There are some Republicans saying there should be no spending except for on defense. Are you saying this is how it should be characterized? I think this is critical to our national security. Look, we've already lost a million Americans. This weekend, as families gather to celebrate Easter Sunday or to celebrate Passover or um, during the holy month of Ramadan, uh, we have folks from all three major global faiths, from uh, Islam, from Judaism, from Christianity, uh, that jointly have their roots in the Middle East millennia ago. All of these great faiths have a common principle uh, to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you and to care um, for those in need around the world. I think we can and should justify this additional spending as critical for our national security or as teaching our values, showing to each other the best in the human spirit and the most central tenets of the faith that inspires so many Americans. For the $10 billion of funding that um, is sitting in Congress uh, for future vote, that would go towards vaccines and treatments here in the United States. Even some Senate Democrats are saying they want to attach some kind of amendment regarding these border uh, restrictions related to COVID. Um, do you see a way out of this standoff? Margaret, it's going to be challenging. So what is the compromise to get around the issue at the southern border? <laughs> Um, well, frankly, what I think you're referring to is the announcement that Title 42, which is a public health measure, uh, may be rolled back in a number of weeks. Um, that's something where the CDC declared um, that they could no longer justify this ongoing practice of expelling folks who come to our border based on the pandemic. Uh, in the region where I'm from, uh, we're seeing infections rise. I think Philadelphia, uh, for example, just returned to a mask mandate. So. My hope is that that will be reconsidered appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that there are both Republicans and Democrats calling for a reconsideration. And the administration just announced a plan for how to deal with a possible surge in crossings at the border. 
Margaret, we do need to come together uh, and show our values that we can secure our border and improve the inhumane immigration system, uh, the immigration system mm -hmm. that so many of us have worked to try and address for years. But I think we can separate that. We should separate that uh, from delivering COVID relief that'll protect American lives and other lives, billions of lives around the world. In some public remarks this week, you said um, the country needs to talk about when it might be willing to send troops to Ukraine. You said if the answer is never, then we are inviting another level of escalation and brutality by Putin. Are you arguing that President Biden Margaret, was wrong when he said he would not send troops to Ukraine? Are you asking him to set a red line? Margaret, I think those of us in Congress who have a critical role in setting foreign policy uh, and in advising uh, the president, in terms of his decisions as commander in chief, uh, need to look clearly uh, at the level of brutality. This is a moment of enormous challenge for all of us. Uh, and I deeply respect President Biden's leadership in pulling together the West, in imposing crushing sanctions uh, on Russia, and in bringing to this fight countries that had stayed on the sidelines before. I think President Biden's leadership has been steady and constructive, but this is a critical moment. If Vladimir Putin, who has shown us how brutal he can be, is allowed to just continue uh, to massacre civilians, to commit war crimes um, throughout Ukraine uh, without NATO, without the West uh, coming more forcefully to his aid, um, I, I, I deeply worry that what's going to happen next is that we will see Ukraine turn into Syria. Mm -hmm. The American people cannot turn away from this tragedy in Ukraine. I think the history of the 21st century turns on how fiercely mm -hmm. we defend freedom in Ukraine and that Putin will only stop when we stop him. I'll close with this, Margaret. This is a weekend when so many families gather to celebrate yes. the very best in the human spirit um, and where we grieve the loss of many to to co due to COVID. We should also be prayerful and mindful of those who are fighting for freedom in Ukraine uh, and how yes. much their heroism and patriotism inspires the rest of us. Senator Coons, thank you and happy Easter. Thank you, Margaret. We'll be right back with a look at the devastating impact of the war in Ukraine on the world's food supply. Stay with us. We go now to David Beasley, the executive director of the UN's World Food Program. He joins us from Lviv, Ukraine. Are you confident you can keep food supply lines open? No, I'm not. I'm not confident at all. There are places that we can't reach, like in Mariupol and other places where Russian forces have besieged the city and, and are not allowing us the access we need. If we get the access, if we deconflict these access points, we can reach every single person that is suffering, struggling for food right now. Given the lack of access to Mariupol, do you believe Vladimir Putin is using starvation? as a weapon. We've seen food depots that have been blown away. I've seen places where there's nothing in these warehouses but food. That, and that's not even in Maripol. And so there's no question food is being used as a weapon of war in many different ways here. And uh, I don't know the reason or the rationale for it. We know the majority of Ukraine's own farmland is in the east where fighting is expected to pick up. Uh, we've seen images of Ukrainian farmers wearing bulletproof vests, still going out there, still tending to their fields. Do you have any sense of how the actual food supply from within Ukraine is going to be affected? No, it's going to be a major factor, Margaret. Ukraine grows enough food to feed four. 100 million people around the planet, 400 million people. In fact, we buy 50% of all the grain we buy from Ukraine, which allows us to feed about 125 million people. And this is a very serious problem. If we don't get the farmers back in the field, not just a few, but all the farmers back into the field so they can plant, they can put fertilizer out, they can harvest, and then equally as important is we've got to get the ports open again. That's the basis and the way by which 400 million people get their food from Ukraine right now. So that's got to be opened up. It's got to be demined. It's got to be deconflicted. And it's got to happen quickly. The UN issued a really frightening report this past week saying food prices are up 34 percent versus a year ago. Um, and that spike is threatening social unrest in countries all around the world. 
what areas are you most concerned about? Um, what areas is the crisis in Ukraine going to cause violence in? It's, it's going to cause problems all around the world. And for example, we've got now 45 million people in 38 countries that are knocking on famine's door. And you may see a general price increase of food, let's say 38 to 40 percent. But in some of the very tough places, this could be 100, 200 percent like in Syria. And let me just give you, for example, in Yemen, we've already cut rations to 8 million people by 50 percent. In Chad, Niger, Mali. We are already seeing an incredible number of people talking about migrating from Central America into the United States, from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras. Just pricing is going up, up, up. If we don't get the food that we need to reach the people in need, whether it's in the Middle East, Northern Africa, or in Central America, you're going to have famine, and you will have destabilization of nations. And then you will have mass migration. And this will cost a thousand times more than if we can get the food and reach the people before they either die or create political unrest or migrate. You're already cutting back on food rations in certain countries because of the crisis in Ukraine. How do you decide that? Because of increased fuel costs, increased food costs, and shipping costs, we are already experiencing a $71 million increase in operational costs per month. So when we don't have enough money, well, guess what? We have to choose which children eat, which children don't eat. We try to reach the most vulnerable children, but it's based on money. There's $430 trillion worth of wealth around the world today. There's no reason a single child should be dying from hunger, much less going to bed hungry. The United States is the single largest donor. Um, in the past, Russia has provided millions of dollars in funding. Do you expect them to cough up a dime right now? Well, we'll just have to see. I mean, they are a major producer of food. There's no doubt about that. And just like Ukraine is the breadbasket of the world, and now they're in bread lines. The United States has been stepping up in major ways, and it's got to step up more in a way it never has before. We're facing a perfect storm right now. We're going to need extra few billion this year. But if we don't get it, you're going to have war conflict destabilization, which is going to cost a thousand times that. Well, there was additional food aid that was cut out of a recent COVID bill on Capitol Hill. Um, for those who say the United States needs to be more fiscally responsible, that it can't continue to pump in more aid money, uh, what would you say to that? How do you persuade some of your fellow Republicans who are skeptical? It's not difficult at all. It's like having uh, a leaking water lines in the ceiling and you don't fix them. And you go have to replace the flooring. You're going to have to replace the, the the table, the chairs, the curtains. It's a lot cheaper to go up there and fix the water lines. If you don't reach the people where they are, it's going to cost you a thousand times more. We feed 125 million people on any given day, week, or month. And I know from firsthand experience, people don't want to leave home. They don't want to migrate. But if they don't have food, and for example, in Syria, we can feed a Syrian in Syria for 50 cents a day. That same Syrian ends up in Berlin or Brussels, the United States. The humanitarian support package is $70 a day. The World Food Program put out a report saying back in 2015, that surge of Syrian migrants into Europe was driven by a cut of funding in World Food Program aid because people couldn't find food in the camps. They went elsewhere. Are you predicting that you see a refugee crisis resulting if there is not more food aid? I have no question about it. This is what Germany and the EU realized their mistake. I have talked with the German leadership and they realized the mistake they made by not going in in advance and dealing with it up front. We survey people all the time. When you feed 125 million people like we do, we survey them. We talk with them. I have met with families. They don't want to leave home, but if they don't have food, I don't know a mother or father in the world that wouldn't do what they need to do to get their child food, and that includes leaving home. Is the crisis in Ukraine diverting resources away from desperate places like Afghanistan? The last thing we want to do is take food from a hungry child to give to a starving child. I don't care where they are in the world. We thought it was bad enough. We had a perfect storm with conflict, climate shocks, and COVID. Then Ethiopia crisis. 
then on top of Yemen and Syria, then Afghanistan did. And just when we thought it couldn't get any worse, and we were running short of monies, which is why we've been cutting rations to children and families and people around the world. Then you have Ukraine, the breadbasket of the world. So we don't have enough money to reach the children in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and Ukraine. And now because we're devastating the breadbasket of the world, there's a possibility that children all over the world, independent of humanitarian aid, are going to not have the availability of food. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark. We'll be back in a moment. The number of migrants crossing the U.S. southern border has already hit a record in March, and we aren't even at peak migration season. We want to go now to Sister Norma Pimentel, the executive director of the Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley. Good morning to you, Sister. Happy Easter. Good morning to you, too. <laughs> Uh, we know all of these numbers are expected to climb in the coming weeks after some of those health restrictions are peeled back at the border. Are you prepared for what is to come? Uh, most definitely. You know, it's what is happening is, has happened for a while already. It's so many years, numbers have increased. But I'm not focused on, on, on Title 42, per se. I'm more focused on ensuring that those families who are at our border that I see daily, uh, uh, who face violence, face persecution, can have access to protection and, and to uh, a humane treatment. Well, you wrote in an op-ed last year, um, you made an appeal for President Biden to come down personally to see some of what you are describing. He hasn't been there yet. What impact do you think uh, a personal experience would have? I definitely believe that somebody, everybody should come to the border so that they ha can have an opportunity to see our community and the people we serve. It, they can get a uh, see for themselves and meet families. I think that that impacts somebody's uh, way of looking at what is happening. And so I definitely encourage President Biden to come and see and to, uh, and to be able to understand more closely what a family that is uh, suffering at the border, uh, how he must decide how to, how to proceed, you know? Well, you've spoken out as well um, about something called the migrant protection protocols, the remain in Mexico policy that I know the Supreme Court is about to take up the, later this month. Um, and this would allow for asylum seekers who are trying to get into the United States to have to stay on the Mexican side of the border while they go through U.S. processing. You said it is immoral, immoral and abhorrent to deter people who are legally and peacefully seeking safety in the United States by deliberately exposing them to the very perils that they are hoping to escape. Can you tell us what are those conditions and what safe alternatives are there? I visit uh, the border in the Mexican side almost daily. And, and what I see is families suffering because of the fact that there's a lot of uh, uh, mm. abuse for the, to them, you know, and the conditions are terrible. And, and there's dangers, uh, the children being exposed to, to being kidnapped, to be snatched, to be hurt. And so uh, it's not right for us to do this. I think that someone who faces violence fears for their lives, for their children's. There needs to be a way to, to access protection, and that's something that we as a nation can offer uh, uh, to them. So you would like to see them housed on the U.S. side of the border rather than the Mexican side? I believe that we as a country can, can find ways to be able to offer protection. That could be in the U.S. side. Most definitely, they're asking for protection and they're fearing for their lives. There needs to be a way to be able to access that protection. And, and there, there's not anything mm -hmm. right now. And so whatever that answer is, I think it's something that we can work to make it happen because these families are in great danger. We are still in the midst of this public health crisis. And I know the federal government has relied a lot on organizations like yours to help carry out COVID tests for those migrants who do cross the border and recently have started to offer them vaccines as well. Um, how does someone who is undocumented even prove that 
they are vaccinated. How do you reassure American people at home that there isn't a health risk? Because we at the border are making sure that anyone that enters the country is pro is being offered that safety, that 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 uh, care, so that if they are exposed to the virus, they can get be isolated mm -hmm. and they can receive that care, so that they don't enter our country and spread the virus anywhere else. And so I think that my the partnership that I have here in in the Rio Grande Valley with our our law enforcement, our our government, city government in McAllen, and the Border Patrol. We work together to make sure that we address this correctly, and and there is not that that fe there should not be that fear for for what is uh, the people that are entering our country. You know, I think that that we must ref help us understand differently what the border is like. If you come and visit and see for yourself, and and understand our community and how we work and also how uh, the people we serve. I know you're not a political person, you are a humanitarian, um, but the work Catholic Charities does with children in particular who have crossed the border got some sharp criticism recently from a conspiracy theorist in this country, Alex Jones. And I understand Pope Francis heard about what was happening and his criticism of you. And I wanna share with our viewers his personal message to you. He said in a video, the migrants must be received, they must be protected, they must be accompanied, and they must be integrated. Four things, receive, protect, accompany, integrate. What did that personal message mean to you? It reaffirmed the fact that we as a country must have that heart to welcome those that are fearing for their lives and to offer them protection, offer them uh, a humanitarian response that cares for humanity. And, and for especially those that who are most vulnerable and, and mm -hmm. fragile and hurting at our border. Okay, sister, thank you for leaving us on that note this Easter. We'll be right back. For more on some of the organizations we've talked about, visit our website. We'll see you next week.